It's every designer's dream to be able to create free from the limitations of reality. The opportunities to do so are few and far between. When Gran Turismo approached McLaren to design the new Vision GT, the stars moved into alignment. McLaren fell so in love with what they were able to create that they decided to make the vision a reality. Today, we're gonna to look at whether what was once a dream is worthy of becoming a halo car. Welcome back and thanks for joining me on a rainy day in the VEC. Thank you very much for your comments, for your feedback. It's great to know, it's encouraging to know that you enjoy the new format and I can't wait to show you this next episode. But before I get into analyzing the Solos GT, I wanna show you something that perhaps only three, four people in the world have ever seen and that is this. This is the model of the Vision GT that was created way back in 2015 by McLaren for the game. And it represents a lot of the ideas that were carried through later to what is now the Solus GT. Now to begin my deep dive on this car, let's begin with the very first thing that you're gonna hear about this car, which is the name, Solus. Now I didn't just say soulless, I said solos, which means to go your own way, to be alone, to move forward on your own, because they intend for this car to be the future vision of their brand, of their mark, the future design vision of how they're going to move forward. However, this name is towing the line a little bit and you have to ask, is it worth the risk? Does this car truly stand alone and is it incomparable to anything else we've ever seen? Well, there was an anime TV series back in the early 90s called Cyber Formula, which had cars that quite resembled what we're seeing here on the screen. That's not to say that this is not a great interpretation of the future vision of McLaren, but it is an example of how this car does not stand alone as much as this name suggests. Now looking at the car from a purely straight on front view, we can see that the car is designed for track. You can see the amount of air that is gonna flow through the body of the car, over the suspension arms, the uh, A arms that are coming through here. That is all gonna be controlled air to optimize the aerodynamics and the downforce on the car. Now I do have a question, and it's these two supporting struts here. I'm not sure if it's just me, but they do look like they don't have enough attention to detail in their design. It is a little bit disturbing to see such a futuristic vehicle with two, let's call them archaic design elements to hold a wing up, almost like they're sitting on pillars, just doesn't feel right. Now, I don't know what the solution is, but there must be a better solution in the future than placing two small struts, two small pillars underneath to support the fenders. Now, the next thing on this design, which I must say bothers me, is the solution for the windscreen wiper. So it's obviously an aero solution. A lot of the race cars use this type of design. They center it, you can see a lot of cars that are on track that have windscreen wipers that are allowed to put windscreen wipers in this position. But for a car of this nature, a $4 million car to use a windscreen wiper as they're showing here, it just doesn't sit well with this type of car for me, this type of design. So futuristic or attempting to be futuristic and using a windscreen wiper, although it's a small thing, does tend to, uh, doesn't sit right with the time period of the car for me. Now the last thing on the front view that gives me a feeling that the car has a little bit of a strange proportion from this view is the minimal width from here to here. 
Now that is obviously minimized for aero. We try to reduce again what is called the cross-sectional area to make it minimal. But this is a single seater, meaning that the passenger's head is probably located right around there. And when we do something like this, you can see that it sort of gives it what we call a pinheaded approach, meaning it's a large body with a very small head on it. And it gives you this feeling of a strange proportion. Now the way to fix that on a design like this, knowing that you have room to play with, is to either pull the base of the windscreen out like that, but the problem with there is obviously you're increasing the cross-sectional area, you're pulling the waist out as well. So instead of doing that, the next solution or the next best solution would be to actually encroach a little bit more into that area and then come to this point again where they began and then you would have a much more sensual, much more flowing shape. So now if we visualize that, and I'll show you what I mean by extending the waist outwards, how much more volume and how much less pinheaded it becomes, increasing again what we call the tumble home, that is obviously going to give it less of that, what we call pinheaded look. And if we do the opposite, or actually decrease the size of the cabin by moving in on the header area, then you'll see how we can also reduce the frontal volume, the, the actual uh, cross-sectional area of the car. So I think that is one of the things that would help enormously to take away that small head, large body feel that the car, and also find a gooder, a gooder? A gooder solution than what we previously had. So I think the optimal solution is to either pull the base out or push it in on the header area. At the moment, it's neither, it's neither one nor the other. It's sort of halfway in between. And it really, as it is now, seems to be calling out too much attention to itself. Anyway, that's about it from the front view. Let's look at it now from that very interesting angle we call the plan view. Now you can see from the very front of the car how it has almost a hammerhead shark look to it. For example, the front area, the front head, sort of having this almost wing extension on it, which is, let's say, reminiscent of a hammerhead shark. You can see the minimal cross section through this area. And then it begins to open up and to continue actually to almost seem like it's actually getting bigger and bigger and wider as it comes to the rear. You would almost expect it to at some point almost become like a teardrop where you would want the shape to start to close in, but it doesn't. It actually widens in this rear end, again, massively wide. But there's a lot of details going on here that start to capture my eye, and I can understand a few of them, but other ones, again, make me quite curious. Now, a car like this, where the passenger's head perhaps is sitting right in this area, if you think his head is here, his eyes are here, that is a heck of a long ways forward for the base of the windscreen. I can only think of one reason why they did it, and it's a packaging reason. The original packaging for this vehicle was such that the head of the driver was not meant to be here, but it was meant to be here. It might come as a surprise, but the original packaging for this car was a driver or pilot sitting on his, well, not actually sitting, laying on his stomach, on his chest, on his belly area. So that was the original packaging. And obviously that distance made sense then. It doesn't make sense for me when you're sitting here in a normal driving position. Design-wise, perhaps that's the reason to have a very almost singular line coming off the hood or off the bonnet or off the front of the car up into the windscreen. Now we'll move on to one area that as I mentioned before is a little bit controversial. I'm referring to the air vent here and to the air vent here. And a lot of complaints I've heard in the past are that we are basically just overcooking, overusing the McLaren logo. For me, it's quite well done, quite well executed because it doesn't 100% relate or represent the McLaren logo. It's almost a future interpretation. And this kind of has a fresh new approach. There are cars like on the P1 where it is immediately recognizable as the logo, but this car uses it in a more restrained way. And I find that actually good, an opportunity to bring in an identifying element. It's in my eyes quite genius-like, but 
it's not purely 100% McLaren. It's leaning towards what we would recognize as a McLaren design element. The rear wing, which is very much, I would say, influenced from Formula One. You can see it has actually two working surfaces to it. Anybody who knows me knows that I perhaps would have added another layer for reasons that those who know, know. Now, my final point on this view is something that I'll need to clear the board first before I explain it to you. So let me just clean all that up. Now, I can see from this view that the car genuinely really looks like something from the future. I mean, this car is very advanced. It's an unusual view, granted, but it does look far out, spatial almost, in fact. But I think the reason for that is that you cannot see the wheels on this car. Now, if you were to take this car and rotate it into a side view without wheels, then it wouldn't look out of place as a vehicle a thousand years from now, perhaps. And there she is in all her glory, the Solus GT. You can see now that it's the wheels that antiquate the design. Previously, when we looked at it from the top, the thing looked like a darn spaceship, pretty amazing, but you put it in the side view, and now these old fashioned wheels are what let the design down. Now, for the sake of curiosity, I would love to see what this design would look like if the design of the wheels leaned into where that future vision of this car is. So let's see what that would look like. And the result for me is obviously a winner because we're eliminating one of those antique parts of the design. Covering the wheels like this could potentially be an engineering headache. But I feel that for me, this is definitely a solution that's worth trying out, finding a way to do it because it definitely takes this car into the future, gives it a much more futuristic feeling and a much more suitable, let's call it, feeling of a wheel to body relationship in terms of overall aesthetics. Now that we have our wheels firmly planted back on the ground, there are a few things I wanna point out that I really like on the car. One is the side sculpting of the panels through here, you can see almost like it's been sculpted almost with an ice cream scoop. And noticing that the shut line is actually through here, it means that the canopy must raise up, slide forward, or basically just slide forward, which then gives you the issue of ingress and egress, meaning you have to get close to the middle of the car to get in, uh, which means that, as I've seen in previous videos on this car, you have a stepping area where you step on the car itself. For a $4 million car, not sure I would feel comfortable with people doing that to my car if they were gonna get into it, but it's a solution. As we move to the rear, again, there are a few things that are quite interesting. It's the way the back of the car has that typical slope downwards for a McLaren. A lot of cars tend to keep the tail end quite high. No need for it actually. The actual sucking down or pushing down of the rear end is a much more aerodynamically efficient way of controlling the, the air through the back of the car. So I'm glad to see that coming down fairly low in the rear. Side view done. Now let's move on to the rear view. Now the rear end design of all the McLaren cars seems to be the strong point. The rear ends always seem to be designed for purpose. They look great. They're uniquely identifiable from the rear. And I think with a car like this, you're behind it, you're gonna know you're behind the McLaren. What I really appreciate with the rear view here is again that stance that this car has on the road. It's very low, it's very wide. And a lot of that, of course, the pinheaded, you can see approach that they use here minimizes the canopy on the top of the car. It almost looks like it doesn't have a canopy or a greenhouse as we call it. The rear spoiler on the car is quite dramatic. You can see the two working surfaces, one, two, and then obviously the shape of it is influenced by high-end aerodynamics. I would perhaps on this car prefer to see something what we call active aerodynamics or even body morphine, which is something coming soon in the future but to have a wing on the back that actually performs great. 
I hope it's active because at different speeds, you need different amounts of downforce. Looking to the rest of it, the massive diffuser area, beautiful, very well handled, very well executed. Now, again, the width is emphasized on this car. You can see that from the rear, this car really has that planted stance that we speak about very nicely. I could also see this car perhaps exposing a bit more of the rear rubber, the rear tire in this area, just to give it that feeling that the wheels are just popping out from the chassis, from the, uh, the actual structure on the body of the car. Now, another very cool thing that gives it almost that spaceship, that sort of floating off the ground feel, is the absence of a view of the inner side of the tire. You can see that the diffuser comes from way in the front all the way continuously to the rear end. And that gives you an amazing control of the air flowing underneath the body. Also, the amount of slope upwards, that kind of transition from having compressed air underneath the car and then suddenly expanding, changing the pressure back here will actually suck the car down. And you can tell that is completely designed for business. It works very well. Now in the previous view, you can see how when I covered up the wheels, it gave it that very almost futuristic feeling. Well, that's the same thing here. By covering the wheels on the inside, you're getting a car that looks like it belongs from another uh, future century or whatever. The look of the signature of the rear of the car is not unique enough and not done as it is even with enough refinement. So obviously I'm talking about the rear tail lamps, these elements right here. That is, I can guarantee you, about as straight a line as you will ever see. When a designer does a line, we have, as I repeated many times before, never used a ruler to design cars. We've always used curves to give the line a bit of tension, be it like an arc or be it like a bow. To simply put a straight line and say that is your taillight shows a little bit of lack of detail or attention to detail for me. Now, what would I do? Well, I would repeat or at least give the intention of repeating the curvature of that line there and given the taillight approximately the same type of curvature so that you avoid that straight line symptom of being sort of in no man's land, not having any excitement at all built into that curvature. And a light like this, perhaps it's very inexpensive to produce it as a straight line. You can almost repeat left and right. But when you add a little bit of tension on that line, you give it a little bit of acceleration, a little bit of curvature, it becomes something quite different. You don't see it, but you feel it. So now in conclusion, those three all important elements of what makes a great design. And again, number one, king of them all, king of the hill is proportions. Does the car have great proportions, at least good proportions? Well, that's a strange one with this car because from the side view, I don't take any issue with it at all. It's nice, looks great, looks exciting, looks dynamic, it's moving while it's standing still. But as I keep my eye on that canopy and I move to either the front view or to the rear view, that's what starts to let it down. That canopy being too small, almost pinheaded as I called it, really starts to let down the overall feeling of the design of the proportions of this car. So I think to make the car, make the Solus GT look exquisitely proportioned, I think they will have to readdress or should readdress the proportion of that canopy to the body relationship. Now the next critical element in terms of great design, that has to be desirability. Now is the Solus GT desirable? Well, I think the most desirable thing, the element that makes it most desirable, is the fact that there are only gonna be 25 of these. And that in itself makes the car desirable. You can imagine the return on investment of a car that costs four million. This thing goes out the door. It can only go up in value. So in that sense, yes, it's desirable, but in terms of its aesthetics, of its design, is it desirable? Well, that's questionable because if I had $4 million burning a hole in my pocket, I think I would go for two P1s, two 720Ss, two 675LTs, and five 
McLaren 12Cs. However, I do feel this car would be significantly more desirable with a much more futuristic treatment to the wheel design. Lastly, identity. Does this car stand on its own like its name Solus suggests? For me, it's lacking that element of surprise, of, of shock, of the wow factors, we call it. The greatest question that you could make somebody ask is, how did you pull that off? How did you do that? And the problem for me is that the Solus really doesn't do that. All the answers are right there for you to see. The floating panels don't actually float, they're held by struts. The wheels, the wheels. The rear is actually the saving grace, the underbody, the diffuser element, where they do cover the inside of the rear wheels. That, again, is perhaps due down to performance, but you can see that performance-driven design does tend to lead to the most aesthetically pleasing solutions. So that type of the design on the rear end emphasizes the lack of that type of design innovation on the side covering the wheels, for example. And the front, with its openness, granted a nice type of design, but it's showing all the mechanical elements. And if you go back to the rear, they're all covered. You don't see any of it. For me, it's lacking cohesion, so no. It doesn't have, in my opinion, a strong identity. So that's a wrap on my analysis of the Solus GT. Let me know, as always, in your comments below what you think. Is this car a future vision for McLaren, or should it have been left back in 2015, and they should have started from scratch with a new design for this project? As always, thank you so much for watching. Remember to put your comments below, and remember to hit that subscribe button. We'll see you again very soon.